welcome for this. This is actually the last webinar of the series on, on risks in the space environment, but uh, not least, I would say, um, because we have with us today um, Sandra Chapman from University of Warwick. And by the way, she just received the Johannes Geis Fellowship, so she'll be staying at EC uh, six months this year in different chunks. So if you happen to visit EC, um, it's a great opportunity to, to meet her. Um, let me just specify that if you have any questions, please write them down in the chat and we'll have time afterwards after her presentation to go through these questions. So if you do have questions, just write them down in the chat and we'll go through the list as, as um, um, in chronological order. And so, as I said, Sandra Chapman, um, we're very happy to have you with us uh, today. Um, I would not go through her whole CV because I, you understand why <laughs> she she's presently at the University of Warwick. Um, she was before that at uh, Imperial College, but she has a long list of rewards and and medals. So. I, to name a few, there's the, the Kospar Zeldovich Medal, the EGS Young Scientist Medal. She had the Royal Astronomical Society James Dungey Lecture, the AGU at Lawrence Lecture, the Lawrence of London Science of Risk Prize, and just to name a few. <laughs> so it is, it's an honor, it's a pleasure to have you with us today for this very last presentation of the series on um, in which we will address a more physical aspect, which is related to the... To the, the the, the the clock, as you will mention, uh, in a solar cycle. So, Sandra, the floor is yours. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Yeah, it's a pleasure to do this. So, I, I, I've heard that this, the, the audience is a mixed one. So, uh, what I've done is I've, I'm kind of do, do a bit of kind of general stuff and I will get in, in into some detail as well. So, hopefully something for everybody, okay? Uh, so, what I want to talk about, um, is it's kind of it's quite a broad thing because I want to kind of I'll start by just thinking about impacts and talking about impacts to summarize that very briefly you know to, so we're all on the same page uh, but really to give a feel for what is it we, we kind of can do and what what's the problem what's the challenge uh, and then kind of to, to focus down a particular question you know you know what is the likelihood of a space weather event and but what do it what does it mean to answer that question actually you know, how do we define that question, which is quite tricky, as it turns out. And then this is where the clock comes in, that there is a solar cycle of activity and, and dealing with that. So that uh, this is kind of my new invention, this clock. OK. And then to give a feel for, you know, what, what, what do we know and what's more topical, you know, and, and what can we say with a high degree of certainty and what can't we? So to give a, a feel for all this stuff. OK, so. So I'm talking about um, what's happened here. Ah, okay, so I'm talking about extreme space weather events um, and where this is a lovely movie from NASA um, and of course this is where they start, they start with, you know, large scale solar flares, uh, coronal mass ejections, okay, ejections from the sun, so there are smaller events which are caused by other things, but these are the kind of things I'm going to focus on the extreme space weather events, and this is where it all starts, and we can carefully image the sun as you can see, um, in high detail now, we can look at the kind of magnetic structure, that's kind of what you're looking at because it's lit up by the, the you know, the, the glowing from the plasma, okay. So, this has a, a number of effects. This is actually from the Washington Post, okay. So, you know, there, there's interest in space weather now. People try to understand what it is and the press are interested. So there's also a problem of communicating, well, what actually is the impact and what do we care about and what do we know? OK, so just just a little potted thing here. You have your solar flare. There are prompt things that happen immediately when you have a coronal mass ejection because it's got a shock in front of it. So it creates, uh, you know, radio bursts, it accelerates particles. You know, so some of the radiation arrives promptly. Some of it takes a few days. It, then the, the, the coronal mass ejection itself, this structure, you know, moves through the solar wind towards the Earth. And when it reaches the Earth, then you get all kinds of effects. And, and so I'm going to focus on one of them here, but, you know, it's everything from the, the, the prompt radiation, which can affect astronauts, which is going to become more important to the effects on satellites, uh, the effects on the ionosphere and, of course, everything passing through the ionosphere, GPS, communications, and then lots of ground based systems. And a lot of which this is the magnetic field effect. So you're inducing currents in the ionosphere and this introduces a ground magnetic field. 
and, and this can affect all sorts of systems on it, all sorts of things. Obvious things, if you've got a long piece of wire, you know, like a, a power grid, you're going to have a ground current in, in, induced it, inducing in it, it's going to cause problems. But also things like the, the direction of the magnetic field is used for drilling for oil, um, you know, things like signaling in, in trains, you know, that, that you can induce, you know, change the current flowing through the signal system because it uses the rails, the trains, all kinds of things. Okay, so I, I will focus more on this magnetic, uh, ground magnetic effect, but there are a bunch of other things as well. And what we want to know, so when we talk about, well, we want the likelihood of a space weather event, I mean, what do, what do we actually mean by that? Because how you specify the question depends on what physics you're going to look at to answer it. And I think this is kind of really important. It's this connection between impact and the physics question we ask. So I'm from the UK. And so this is the UK risk register. So every few years, the UK government produce a register of risks and they produce a kind of chart like this one. And all these little numbers are the risks and the arrow is pointing to where space weather is, a space weather event, there it is. So this is your number 19, okay? And so this table, and it, it, this is to guide policy is, is how much you care about it, how much money you're gonna spend on it, so forth. It, risk, it does likelihood. So this is the, you know, the one in 100 year event, one in 500 year event. So this is five to 25 in 500, okay? And then the level of impact. And so the level of impact requires us to sort of pick a threshold in some kind of physical quantity, you know, and then translate that into real impact on systems. So you want likelihood and you want it in terms of impact. Okay, and these are the kinds of impacts um, that, that, that they're attributing to space weather. Okay, it, this, it's, it's a category C, which is they're looking at impacts of 100 million to a billion. Okay, and there's a whole kind of list of what, how this would impact the UK, uh, you know, essential services, electricity supply, all this kind of thing. Once you start knocking power and communications out, it has all kinds of impacts. So we're translating, we, we need a threshold that goes from, you know, a physical kind of uh, what's happening, you know, in response to the flare, to the CME, to the impact to policy. And do, joining all those things up is, is, is quite tricky. Okay. The insurance industry, of course, they're really interested in this. They insure the satellites. Lloyd's, who started in, in you know, the, the coffee houses of London insuring ships, now insure satellites and they've got solar storm at number 16 at 6.5 billion okay that's the amongst all these other risks pandemic is up there at number four okay of course they put market crash at number one because they're an insurer um it's kind of interesting so you know that they're, they're deeply interested in you know having some idea of likelihood and they ask me to talk to them from time to time to try and get you know how good are the numbers okay so what can we do to say something about space where the likelihood and impact. And so the, po the point is the system now is really well instrumented. We've got everything from the thing I showed you before, imaging of the sun so you can look at flares. We can look at this, the solar cycle variation, which is what's shown here. This guy is minimum and this guy's maximum. It's all speeded up, obviously. The sun takes 27 days to go around, okay. Um, we can look at um, what happens it's just, this is looking at the solar wind, so the sun is hiding behind the disk, okay, and you can actually image the solar wind, the stuff coming out from the sun. This is actually, I, I just grabbed that from this week, and you can see there's, the solar cycle's getting going, there's some activity, okay, in a minute we'll see a little uh, halo CME, hopefully, so that little shap there, okay, when it's coming right at you, it looks like a kind of halo. Uh, and then, of course, you get the effect on Earth, there's the aurora, I don't know that's popped back. Okay, so... But the problem with this, so you look at the, you think, well, okay, I can look at the sun and I can tell when this thing pops off. And then, okay, you've got the prompt stuff, but then the stuff that produces the magnetic perturbations of Earth, that takes several days because you've got to wait for the CME to come. You can see it coming. So we've got this nice imaging and it's nice recent imaging. I can just watch, leisurely watch it come and say, okay, how big is it? Blah, blah, blah. And of course this is done. Um, however, if you, you look at the scale, the Earth is really small. I mean, and, and okay, the, the CME is very big. You know, it's very hard to gauge whether the thing is actually gonna hit Earth or it's gonna miss. So that's, that's the second problem. First problem, we don't know when the flare is gonna go pop. We can see the thing, we can see once it goes. Second problem, um, will it hit us? And that's how, when you look at that halo, halo CME, that one turned out to be actually a grazing one. So they were predicting sort of, you know, maybe slightly more or moderate, whatever, based on the guy I just showed you, the recent guy for today, okay. 
uh, the, the, the last problem is, of course, well, what happens when it reaches Earth? OK. Um, and again, we now have lots of data from the recent past it, that the Earth system is very well instrumented. So we've got lots of satellites in space. We've got, you know, everything from things sitting upstream in the solar wind, watching the sea may come by, things moving in and out of all the layers of the magnetosphere. What is the shock doing? What's the magnetic field doing? Lower stuff, looking at the ionosphere. We've got GPS, so you've got whole maps of, of ionospheric density, you know, at, at, at sort of, well, in principle, at, at sort of second scale, but these things are pr produced on the web at 15 minute scale. And of course, magnetic field on the surface of the earth, hundreds of magnetometers. And you take all that stuff and you put it through the brains of, of people like me or, you know, space plan and physicists, and they will come up with things like this, which is here is a drawing of the earth system. And it's really complicated, lots of currents everywhere, all sorts of stuff. OK, uh, and these current systems that map into close to the earth are things which can cause, you know, ground effects, including to power grids and things like that. Um, the problem with this is the details of how this responds really depends particularly, it depends on the, the CME, particularly on the orientation of the magnetic field, because you can magnetically connect the CME it, it, into the Earth's magnetic field if they're kind of anti-parallel at the front. And you don't know that until it passes, you know, a monitor sitting upstream at the L1. OK, so you don't get several days really to know quite how what the impact is going to be. It also depends on the state of the magnetosphere. So it's, you know, it, it's something you could forecast you could run a forecasting model for so it's kind of tricky but once you know what's coming in detail it's it's doable okay event by event okay so here's just an, an example one of mine to, of the sort of things you can do just to give a feel for how much data there is and what modeling we have so this is work i've been doing with our, our british geological survey in the uk the thing on the left is showing you where the magnetometers are on the earth's surface so we've got lots of these things but there's still only like a few you know, there's the UK. And what we're going to do is take these guys and take a past huge storm. OK, uh, and we've got the October 2003 event. And I'm going to put it into through a model for what the current should be in the ionosphere uh, and a model which contains the detailed ground uh, conductivity, which one of, one of BGS's jobs to know this and a model for the UK National Power Grid, which is you're, you're looking at a map of it here and run that and say, okay, what's the effect on the power grid when we do when we ha have this event, okay? And we're doing something interesting here. So this is running the storm through. I'm actually calculating the correlation network between all points on the grid. So it's, you can see all these little connections, you can see how they're intermittently popping up and down very quickly. So what this is, it's saying you're inducing currents. These aren't the induced currents, they're actually the correlation. So one bit of the grid is, is being affected by the other. OK, and you can see lots of things. Some of them, they're picking up lines horizontally. These are the big 400 kV lines. So some of it's following the grid and some of it isn't. It's hopping. So you can do things like this in, in quite fine detail and say, well, OK, some nodes on this grid are actually sensitive to what the other ones are doing. So it tells me there were only four magnetometers. Well, where should I be sensing what the grid's doing? Where should I instrument it? And what's the effect going to be and how widespread it's going to be? So we can make all these kinds of detailed mappings between here is a past event that happened and we've, we've observed it and we've got data all through the modeling to what's going to happen to ground in detail and then go to the, the people managing the national grid and say, well, maybe you want to do this, this and this. And, and, you know, in order to modify how you're going to respond to the storm in real time. So we can do, that's the sort of things we can do. Okay. And here's just a, a little snapshot in case you didn't see what was going on there. So, the, what, again, what these are, they are cross correlation networks based on wavelets. So looking at the sharp changes in the global uh, GICs, the ground induced currents. And some of them are picking up the grid features, which are the cross 400 kV lines going across, and some are not. So it's not just the interesting thing to take, take from this is it's not just the physical structure of the grid that you're just seeing. So it's not, you know, you think, well, I know where the wires are. So if I just multiply that by some number where the wires are tells me what the impact's going to be. That's not true. And the reason is you're folding in the dynamics, you're folding in the fact the current system is moving, but also the ground conductivity. So this kind of study is actually quite important. You can't just say, well, I know where there's more wires, something's going to happen. That's not what happens. It's more interesting and detailed than that. OK, but nevertheless, one can do something. OK, the other thing that's done is then to say, OK, what if you get a real big guy, you know, because 
we've seen a few of these in the past and we have some data. Um, now that our um, infrastructure has changed, this is a real interesting question with impact. We of course have a lot more sensitive infrastructure now than we used to have. It changes over time, okay? Uh, so we had a storm in 1921. We have this huge storm. We measured the magnetic field on the Earth's surface. And one of the things you measure, big depression, you've got a big current overhead. It makes a big dB by dt. And so you can measure that guy and then say, OK, let's kind of try and model what would happen today if this happened, because we're constantly changing how much sensitive instrumentation we're putting on the Earth. And that this is an example of that. And you come up, you can come up with these quite large, serious impacts that you'd, you'd you know, in this case, trash about you know a third of the US power system, the power grid. That's, I mean, it takes a long time to get power grids back up. So you know that's why it's a problem. Okay, so we can do things like that and you can put a cost on it. So like this, this is another example. Um, you can say, okay, if I modeled it, how much would that have cost in, in modern day terms? There are actually examples where, where blackouts actually happened. And so you actually know what it cost. And then you can map back and say, well, this cost us so much. Um, what was that in terms of a physical parameter? So I, I'm starting to talk about DST now, and I'll talk about what DST is in a moment. It, it's an average of ground magnetic perturbation at the equator, okay? So now what we're trying to do, so well, here's an impact of so many billions or whatever, what does that translate to into a number which I can go measure? And then I can put a threshold and then I can get the likelihood. That's a really tricky thing to do because the important thing is really these very fine, the thing I showed you a moment ago on the national grid, things were very fast changing in time. This really spiky stuff, it's the fast DH by DTs that really cause the problems. So this parameterization in terms of just the, what the field's doing is actually not great, okay? But it, it's something that's done and I, I, we'll see why in a moment, okay? So um, there is this problem um, that we, it's very hard to kind of understand um, how geoeffective something's gonna be. We can see the flare coming, we can model the CME and so forth. But you know what in detail is the impact going to be on our systems depends on the detail of what's going on at Earth. Uh, but we can look across many events and, and then try and you know look across time and try and get an overall likelihood. So so this is so this is going from a kind of forecasting way of thinking, which I was saying taking an individual event and, and use modeling and so forth, but what ha what happened in that event to a kind of probabilistic approach now and just saying, well, let's just ask for the likelihood. Okay. Um, and what I'm going to do to do this now, to now focus on likelihood, is to focus on a particular aspect of the thing and to say it's, it's this ground magnetic perturbation. And so I'm sure some of you have heard of a particular example of this, and this is this Carrington superstorm. So the first time this ground effect was noticed and linked to what the sun might be doing was in 1859, uh, where you know, Carrington was, was observing famously the sun and, and saw some flaring, and then a few days later there were aurora at really low latitudes there were sparking of telegraph wires so the long, first long wires that, that were people could run the telegraph without any power the aurora powered it you know so there were these disruptions and there was the connection made between magnetic disturbances at earth something happening on the sun and this goes way back okay so we're going to have to start thinking about historical data now to say something about the carrington storm okay and what we want to know, well, certainly what policy makers and insurance guys and you know, everybody, you know, <laughs> who's kind of has put money in the game wants to know is, well, is this actually going to be, you know, the end of the world or is it just going to be, you know, expensive and inconvenient? You know, because some of these things, OK, there might be a power cut. But, you know, in this country, we've had power cuts for several hours. Nothing to do with space weather, to do with the fact that, you know, we had one transformer tripped and a new solar wind farm tripped because they hadn't quite calibrated the solar wind farm. And so the system then tripped out a whole bunch of, you know, power to several cities. So it's just somebody just hadn't quite got their stuff organized yet on, the, on how they managed the grid power. Nothing to do with space weather. And that was several hours. So, you know, that's 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 in the expensive and inconvenient bucket. OK, so are we talking about that or are we talking about what we're seeing here in, in the British press, you know, end of the world stuff? OK, um, and so that's kind of what we want to say something about. OK, and we will need to say something about the solar cycle, which is where the clock comes in. 
as you, as you can see here, these are you know, extreme ultraviolet images of the sun at different phases of the 11 year cycle. You go from a very quiet period to an active period. This is the kind of magnetic structure. These things will turn into CMEs, okay. And so if you count sunspots, which are just the spots on the surface, which are sitting at the bottom of these structures, then they go up and down. And of course, okay, it's, I said 11 years, but it's never quite 11 years. It's sometimes more, sometimes less, sometimes active, sometimes quiet. Um, you know, it would be nice to predict ahead, not only for the next space weather event, but for the next sort of cycle or half cycle to know how active it's gonna be. Okay, so as I said, we need to pick a threshold in some kind of physical quantity and then look at its likelihood. Okay, and the thing that everybody kind of goes with is a quantity called DST and where this comes from and, and successes to DST. It's a geomagnetic index. So this is, you know, instead of where well, we've got loads of magnetometers, um, we want a number. And this, this originated from, the, you know, the first discovery of the Van Allen belts. Here, here you can see Explorer 1 being celebrated, okay. And so the Van Allen belts, of course, are uh, layers of intense particles that are trapped in the Earth's closed field lines. And there's a current that flows around the Earth. And when you have a storm, it compresses it, it enhances it, it pumps more energetic particles. So you see a big current. And so in the, at the equatorial region, you see a rate of change of magnetic field at the Earth. OK, so what you want to do is put magnetometers there and measure what's happening. OK, and so this is what DST is based on. You, you, there are many magnetometers now. And so there's a SMR, which is a kind of souped up version of DST. But originally they had four and you calibrate them and kind of try and line them up with the equator and you average them and you get an hourly average. And that's what I'm plotting here. So this is the DST. When you get one of these storms, you enhance the, the, the ring current you get a depression in DST and you can see these spikes here and I've colored them in, I've picked little bits of the cycle. This is the sunspot number. So you can see here is what DST looks like at the last few successive maxima. Um, and we've only got DST for these few solar cycles. And of course, really we'd like a lot more solar cycles because the, the solar cycle is never the same, but nevertheless, we've got these few. So we'll give that a go, okay? So it's this hourly average. The thing that's interesting is that what we're looking at, you know, I'm talking like it's a big thing. It's, of course, a few hundred nanotesla compared to what the Earth's background field is. That's actually quite small. So there's a lot of calibration that has to go on here to get rid of it. So the way you do this, of course, it, it depends on um, there's the Earth's dipole, obviously, but also the, the Earth's quiet, you know, magnetic field, which is not dipolar because it's distorted by the solar wind. So you want to kind of take this into account. So the idea is if you've got, you know, everywhere, um, lots and lots of magnetometers, you can kind of calibrate this stuff out, okay? And there are different ways that people do this. And it will be seasonal as well, because of course, it depends how the earth's pointing with, you know, with respect to the flow of the solar wind and these kinds of things, okay? Uh, so there's DST, which is the original average for, uh, from these four stations. There's a new one, SMR, which is minute resolution with many more stations put in, but the same kind of idea, okay? So we're gonna use this number, even though we know that actually the fast change of magnetic field is the thing that can be important. We're gonna say, okay, never mind. We'll just go with this guy because I've got lots of historic data of it and I can do something, okay? And so people have looked at this extensively. They, at DST, they've done it to death. And here is an example of trying to say, what is the likelihood of um, events seen in DST, okay? So th there are things you have to do here. You don't just look at the values. You we can get information from the values, but you can also say, I'm gonna pick out events. I'm gonna threshold and look at the peak of a threshold and use that to pick events out. And then say, okay, well, I, I can plot these things. And this is a kind of uh, solar cycle aggregate because of course the problem is if you have rare events and you're trying to do a kind of frequentist approach, you've only got a few. Uh, so, um, you know, you're going to kind of want to plot them and, and aggregate as much data as possible. So you tend to aggregate over the solar cycles. OK, anyway, this is what you get. And these are attempts to fit it. And the point I'm making here is the numbers are quite broadly varying. You know, you can fit different distributions, but there's a lot of spread in, in what you think the extreme events are doing based on this. Uh, that's quite a lot. OK, but people have tried their best to kind of figure out what they, what's doing. This is quite a nice example. OK. So um, 
the solar cycle variation. So I'm kind of showing this here. So this is this is a rank order plot, okay? Uh, I'm showing you a rank order. This 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 is celebrities organized in increasing height, okay? So this is a rank order plot of celebrity height, um, and you can see them all lined up here. Um, and I'm going to do the same for the data. I'm going to line up the data in you know uh, size. So so up the side here is is the size you know, the, the value that you see in, in, say, DST, and along here is the rank, okay, uh, where you are, smallest to largest. And so what I've done here you, is line these all up, but I've taken little slices for the solar maxima, okay, so you can see these, these are the different solar maxima, okay, coloured in, okay, and it's just to make clear that, okay, the solar, we, we said, well, the strength of the solar cycle goes up and down, and you it does indeed show up very clearly in DST. So for instance, here, this is the last unusually quiet cycle 24. You can see this DST never gets above, the depression in DST never goes beyond 200. Um, whereas in the other cycles, it gets much bigger. Okay. So there's a clear solar cycle variation here that we're gonna to have to think about. Um, and I'm gonna try and do that. Okay. Uh, but first I'm gonna lump it in. The other thing one can do, Okay, remember I sort of said, well, um, there's only a few of these extreme events. That, that there's a, uh, you could actually just look at the distribution itself of the values and say, well, can we get from the, the distribution of the values to the extremes? And this is what I'm gonna just mention here very briefly. So what I'm doing here, I'm actually looking at SMR. So remember I said there's DST, this hourly index. SMR, we've now got more magnetometers so we can improve it. Uh, DST based on four, SMR will put many more magnetometers in higher time resolution, and that's what I'm using here. And so what I'm plotting are quantiles of SMR for the last few cycles. So but by quantile, I mean 0.99, that's if I rank ordered the data and said, well, where's the top 1%, the guy that's the top 1%, that's this guy, okay? Or where's the, the top quarter? That's the 0.75 quantile. And I plot those and you can see they're all going up and down nicely with the, solar, with the sunspot number, with the solar cycle. So there's clear correlation with the, you know, the values overall of what you know, SMR or DST is doing with the solar cycle. And we can see that here. And just to remind everybody, this is how the, much the solar cycle varies. This is, this is going back to 1700. OK, so we kind of, you know, this is giving us some some hope here that if, if we can predict what the, the sunspot number is going to do. And there's a lot of effort in that, you know, trying to figure out what that's going to do. Then we can then say, OK, well, maybe we can say what DST is going to do and we can get the likelihood. So quite a long prediction into the future of the likelihood of these events based on this, this particular metric. So that could be quite hopeful. And there's a little bit more we can do. That is an extra twist. And this is the following. Hard to get extreme events because they're so rare, uh, but we can just measure the, the values and there is a relationship crossing theory between the values, just the, the observations and bursts, events, okay? And, and it's quite a nice idea. It's extremely simple in a way. So this, this guy, this is this, the CDF. So this is a bit like the rank order plot that I was just talking about, okay? C of U, U is the threshold. OK, this is the average time I spend above the threshold. And this is how often I cross up. So this is like a, a return period, which is what you want is, you know, people talk about the one in a hundred year, blah, blah, blah. How often does an event of the, uh, cross that threshold? And you can't get them independently, but they're related to each other. What it's really telling you is, you know, for a certain rank order plot or CDF, um, if I know how often I'm above the threshold, that constrains how often I cross and how often I stay up. The total time up just depends on how often I go up into that set and how often I, I and how long I stay there before I come back down again. So it's quite a nice constraint on, on what the extreme events might be doing. And it kind of it's kind of really nicely goes with the solar cycle. So I'm showing this here for SMR again. Um, so I'm plotting the duration of burst times above, looking for events now here against the black line, which is the sunspot number. Uh, this is the return period. This is just the same thing zoomed in, okay? And again, you'd expect, so you'd expect duration to be longer, bigger events at maxima here. And it kind of is, but not always. You'd expect the return period, how long you have to wait to go up at minima, which is here, there they are. And it kind of does that, but not always, okay? But if you get this ratio, 
tau over r, it just follows the sunspot number really nicely. So, you know, we, we could be, this again, if, if you know what the sunspot number is going to do, you can then say something about what um, the likelihood of extreme events, you know, on this particular metric will do, which would be really useful. So, so there's useful connections all in this. Okay. So now what I want to do, because I'm going to build my clock now, um, I want to go back further. Okay. Um, we've, We've only got DST for five cycles. And as you see, the, the solar cycle is varying a lot more than that. Five cycles isn't really going to do it for you. And you, also, you don't get many extreme events in five cycles. Um, so let's go further back. If you go further back, you're looking at this kind of data. This is actually the Carrington event. So this is literally, they are pen charts. OK, so going back to 1868, we've got two stations. We've got one at Greenwich, OK, it, it, near London. And we've got one or there's a couple in Australia. OK, and so they're antipodal. So it means you can kind of use them to get rid of the background. Remember, that's the problem. Background is, is huge compared to what you're trying to measure. OK, so what's been done, what was actually measured is um, basically somebody would go to, to the station every three hours with a little piece of logarithmic paper and hold it up to the pen chart, you know, all calibrated for where you are and give it a number, you know, up to nine. And that's been translated back into nanotesla. So that's what this quantity actually is, a combined between the stations. So this is a famous work by Mayo, okay. And, and that's, that. this is called the AA index. So we're gonna use this, uh, but with a massive kind of, you know, pinch of salt, okay. Um, if we wanna go back to the Carrington event, we don't even have AA for that. We now have a single station data, which is shown here. This was actually done, people looking at, um, that you hang a thread and you magnetize a needle and you go across the room and look at it with a telescope and look at the you know deflections. So you can see when the event happened, they got really excited and were doing more and more measurements. You can see that the cadence goes up, okay. It gives a massive depression, a massive depression. And so there's a big controversy around this guys to, you know, what does this mean in terms of DST? You know, how do we compare this guy to the other events for which we have the AA index or the DST, which is what I'm gonna talk about now, okay. So looking at this AA index to get a feel for what this data is like, I've plotted the rank order plot again. Remember you put things small to large. This is the thing I showed you for DST. There's the small cycle 24, here's the other cycles. I've taken the same data for AA and so that you can kind of see they follow, but you see this kind of steppiness. This is because it's really just numbers up to nine being combined in there. So you, you kind of see it's very steppy. OK, but it kind of follows it, you know, so you can't treat this as a time series, but you can kind of do something with the level is, is, is got some information in it. And so in that spirit, I'm going to say, OK. I can ask for the maximum of DST because it's a it's a decent measurement. I can say, well, what's its maximum in a year, say, uh, and I can ask for maybe look at the top, say, 0.5 percent of AA and say, well, what you know, what does that do or the top 5 percent, top few percent? And that's what I'm doing here and plot one against the other. And you can see they kind of follow each other. And that's what I'm showing you. So if I do that by year, for the years I've got DST, I'm showing this AA annual average. So I'm not trying to find an individual event now because the data is not very good. But I'm saying if I look at the annual average of the top 0.5% of the AA numbers, and I look at the DST annual maximum, and they more or less follow each other. They're not 100%. You can see there are things where they miss, but you know, it's not too bad. And then I can immediately get something that's going to say, well, if now if I use DST as my threshold, you know, to say, well, what, what DST is a great storm or what DST is a severe storm, which people are doing. So a severe storm is when DST, you know, you get to get this big bay below, say, 250, a great one below 500. OK, and I draw these lines across. Um, I can count how many times that happened in the last 150 years because I've got AA for 150 years. So I convert DST into AA. How often did that happen? And so immediately get some number. OK, 4% of years out of the last 150, I saw a great storm. OK, 28% contained a severe storm. So immediately some kind of likelihood. And this is much more. OK, the AA, on the one hand, the AA data is way worse than DST. But on the other hand, you're looking at a lot more of the behavior of the sun. You know, a lot more cycles than there are there just four, okay? So it's still a solar cycle average, but it gets us a little bit more confident in terms of knowing what's going on with different behavior. Okay, 
And then I can sort of say, well, what can I say about the Carrington event? OK, remember, I don't have the AA for this. So what I'm doing here is, again, this is the rank order plot. And I've kind of saved the top space. I've sort of said, well, you know, let's see where that would turn up. Because you can see here are all the other guys. OK, and, and I could kind of draw a line through them, which means it's because this is semi log. So it's an exponential. And it says, I know it's an exponential. I know where the next guy would be. And I know what the uncertainty would be. And that's what's here. And then I can go say, well, OK, what do we think the Carrington event was then? And people argue about this, OK? If you read off this plot, then you get 1760 and it's way up here. It's good to speak. You know, people, it doesn't mean it didn't happen, but that's what they measured. But then it's been argued, well, yeah, but DST is this hourly average. So maybe you should like hourly average it. And if you do that, you, you're down here. OK, so maybe that tells you that's what it is. I, I don't interpret this as meaning that, that it must be 850. It, it kind of says something a bit more subtle than that, I think. Uh, and it's the following. So it's this is this idea of Dragon King, Sornet's idea, OK? Uh, and this is one of his papers. He's plotting um, agglomerations, means signs, sizes of cities. So what he's saying is if you look at kind of regular cities, these are French ones, obviously, you know, he's French, you know, Marseille or Nice or something, and you put them on here, they all follow this kind of distribution, the one I've just shown. But if you look at Paris, it's kind of right, it's off the map. Paris is off the map. Paris is different. It's like London and New York, they're global cities. So the sizes of Paris and New York and London are affected by different things to the sizes of other more regional towns and cities. And so if this space where they're in, if the Carrington is kind of off the chart, as I just showed, it means the physics that gives you that kind of event is different from the other guys. And what that actually means is I can't use my knowledge of the smaller guys to tell me about the likelihood of the Carrington event. And that is actually a rather important point. So I'm not saying it couldn't be that big. I'm just saying if it's 850, we kind of know how likely it is from the other ones. It's, it's on the same distribution and presumably the same physics. But if it's this larger number, something else is going on. And, and so we have to think about what that might be. And, and therefore the likelihood will just be had to come from some different understanding. Okay. Um, one possibility for that um, is what's happening here. So this is just another event. This was when the solar cycle, this solar cycle started to kick off and they said, oh, it's a cannibal. What, what they meant was that one CME comes out from the sun and then the other one catches up with it and forms a kind of supersized event. So, so it's a correlated extreme now. And so it's going to have a different likelihood of occurrence to something that's just one CME, one storm. OK, so this is kind of the sort of thing that might be going on. OK, um, so now I'm going to do this clock. Um, so I want to do, deal with this solar cycle thing now head on. So what do we do? Uh, this is the sunspot number going back to 1750. And I'm looking at monthly sunspot numbers here. And the point is that the period that the 11 years is not really 11 years, it's varying. But if I have something that's kind of oscillatory, I can transform it into something that's on a uniform phase. And that's what a Hilbert transform does. So if you think about my signal is oscillating along, it vague, you know, it's not perfectly sinusoidal, but I'm gonna perform a transform such that it goes around, it has amplitude and phase. I'm gonna construct an analytic signal with a time varying amplitude and a time varying phase. That phase will then clock around between naught and two pi, and that will define a regular cycle. And that's where we're gonna kick the clock. So to do that, I have to subtract off a background because it, it's got to be vaguely oscillatory and because sunspot number is, is positive, right? So I'm to just do a running mean, okay? And I subtract that off and then I get the amplitude and I get the phase. And these are showing all the cycles going between naught and two pi, okay? And I'm gonna explain what these things are in a minute. Okay, here are all the maxima, these little kind of wheels. Here are all the minima. Um, the, the lines here, okay, these little diamonds, are terminators so this is this is an idea of scott mcintosh's that you, you know you, you get the sun the sunspots are formed at high latitudes and then they come down to the equator and they annihilate you know that's the end and then the next cycle starts okay um you can follow them with the uv bright points and so forth when they terminate that that's when these little guys are and so i've drawn a line through these terminators this is when when the new cycle was just switch off and there's another line here that i'm going to show you what it is just to say, well, what is this, this little background that I subtracted off? 
it turns out this is the Gleisberg cycle. I mean, I just did it thinking I'll take a running mean. And this is it compared to the Gleisberg cycle. There's a long-term, so, so well-known cycle of sunspot activity. So that's the thing that we're subtracting off to look at the oscillation. And this is my clock. So I've taken the 0 to 2 pi and I put it on a clock. You can see it here. So it goes round in the clockwise fashion. So, it, you know, each cycle takes you around once, they're, they're roughly 11 years. And then what I can do is just put loads of data on top of the clock. And I'm in the market for new data. So if people come say, oh, I've got some more data to put on here. It'd be really interesting. I'm, I'm in the market for it. And so what I'm showing here is here are all the minima, here are the maxima, here are the terminators, as I say, when the, when the uh, sunspots reach you know, the equator, um, the black lines, these are AA. So looking at, you know, values of, because AA is discrete, I've said, well, when does it exceed like 100, 2, 3, 4, 500 nanotesla and, and put them on ex expanding circles. So each streak is a big storm. So all these streaks are really big storms day in a, in a day. This is F10.7. Uh, you know, it's linked to what's happening in the ionosphere. These are GOES X-ray flares, C, M and X class. And you can see there's a big gap here and that's your quiet period. So here's your maximum and here's your quiet period. So here's the terminator and you can see there's quite a sharp um, switch on of activity and a quite a sharp switch off and a gap. And that, that I think is the interesting thing. This, I call this the pre-terminator. I just drew this on. It just happens to be, if I reflect this angle, this is where the, the average minimum is. Okay, and, and put that sort of, that's two pi over five. If I just put that angle two pi over five there, it just turns up and I don't know why. It's really interesting. It's just, that's kind of, so this is a rough thing. It might not be exactly there. It's just roughly where you just think, oh, well, that's interesting and put it there. Okay. And if you do that and you look at the occurrence of events and that's what I'm stacking up here. So I've unpacked the clock in pseudo 11 years. You can see, interestingly, OK, the more moderate storms in AA, they kind of turn up through the quiet phase. These are not things coming from flares. These are things that are more likely to be coming from co-rotating streams in the declining phase. Uh, if you look at the really extreme events, they hardly ever occur. There's like one in this quiet phase in the last 150 years, OK? Uh, and that's what you're seeing in the flares as well, the most intense flares. So there's a kind of, kind of mapping between these things. And there's your F10.7, so it's quiet in this quiet period, which is Mark Gray. Okay. Well, can we actually get the clock? I mean, okay, the, the people are nice, but I just want to know when things are going to happen. And that's what, what's going on here. We say, okay, we can do a Hilbert transform and read off the times when the quiet phase starts, you know, when it ends. So the switch off and the switch on of the clock. We can, we can read those things off, okay? Um, um, uh, we could do the Hilbert transform. Hilbert transform is actually quite tricky to map it forward, but yeah, that's what you want to do. You want to predict, right? To track it forward is quite tricky um, because of edge effects. Um, so what we do, could do instead is something else. If you, if you notice on this plot, where the thing kind of crosses, you know, all these lines of the switch-offs and switch-ons, it's actually kind of quite close to where the, the sunspot number crosses the Gleisberg cycle. So actually, if I just say, well, let's, let's see when the sunspot number up crosses the Gleisberg cycle, that's the switch on, okay, when activity switches on roughly. And when it comes down, it's actually a kind of a, I'll, I'll just guess, it's a bit after, I'll just guess a year after. So what I'm doing on the left-hand side is regressing those two things. Let's regress the slow trend and the sunspot number, you know, at, at where, you know, the, the terminator and the pre-terminator are. And you can see they're quite linear. It means you're close to, you can do a linear extrapolation around there. So we can probably just get these switch offs and switch ons straight from the sunspot number and not have to do all this Hilbert stuff, which is tricky to predict forward. So that make, make, makes it a lot more powerful. Okay. Uh, so finally, uh, what could we use this for? And what I want to go, where I want to go with this is to say, um, I started this talk by saying, well, look, there are all these impacts. We want to know about impacts. But actually, we've been looking at things like DST and AA, and they're not that closely correlated, but we're kind of stuck with it. So this is trying to do something better. So this is a chart. And what I'm doing, I've unpacked the clock. This is time. And these lines are all the cycles. OK, so here's the switch off of activity. There's the solar minimum, these green things. 
There's the switch on the terminator. These are the solar maxima, these red things. And of course I can put on here things like, or when DST is big. So that's all the stars. And I can put on things like AA, big events in AA. So those are physical things. So DST will get you back to about here, 1950s. AA will get you back to here about 1850s. And we'd like more and we'd like impact. But I can just put anything, as long as I know the time it occurs, I can stick it on here. So I can now compare all sorts of things, which statistically I could never do. I can't make a distribution or do any of this stuff because I want to compare, oh, this chap saw an aurora or, oh, something funny happened on my telegraph, right? And I want to compare that. And so that's what I'm doing here. So we're comparing, uh, as I say, AADST, comparing things like uh, people have ways of picking their favorite big events. Did it exceed this? Did it do that? All different ways of comparing them. So, you know, we've got squares and circles. That's what all these things are. And then these are, we saw a big aurora. So you can go push right back with that. And so now you can really get a picture that not much is happening in this quiet time, but also big things are happening right at the edge. So like there's this 1903 event here and over here, you can see the star. Okay, these are big events. Look, this chap here, the switch on is quite dramatic. Okay. Um, these big events, one of them is this is this 2012 event, okay, which was the star. And what happened here, it didn't hit the Earth, but it was calculated it would have been huge because it, it crossed another satellite. Okay. Um, and that, even at the time, you know, people said, well, this thing happened when you were far from maximum, you know. And it's the same with the 1903 guy. It's kind of like, well, you know, this, it, this is really worrying because it, it wasn't a solar maximum. It was closer to minimum. And so now we actually see what's going on, that these guys, here they are, they're actually just switching on really, you know, quite at the switch on. So you need to know when that is, but once you do know, that's actually quite powerful. So it's the, so the statement that, oh, you know, big events can happen at any time, max or min, this is refining that statement. And so well, actually they, they can happen far from maximum, but they're happening in the active time. And we can kind of figure out when that is because we can use this clock. So if there are people out there who have more historic data to put on this, I would love to talk to you because, you know, you can see what we really want is to fill in this earlier stuff and, and to get a stronger idea to test this and also different kinds of societal stuff. So there's there's another little symbol down here, which is an event that wasn't that big in terms of DSD or what have you. Um, but actually, in terms of impact, it was quite big. So we can start to say, well, what, what, if you're looking at actual impact, when, they, when did they have? OK, so just there's one more thing this is useful for and that's maybe saying what's happening in the next cycle so 25 is getting going now and this is noah's prediction and you can see it's it's a bit bigger than the the kind of average prediction um there is a relationship which is um that the duration oh. of the last cycle should tell you how active this cycle should be and that's what this graph is here so what we're doing is just refining this. This is a well-known relationship, but we're refining this because now we know when the switch-ons are. So we can count from one switch on one terminator to the next. And this is what it looks like. For, for all, all the past maxima are being plotted on here, the size of the maximum and, and the delta. And what I've drawn here is because we've just crossed, I've, I've, I've you know, gone and, you know, done the Hilbert transform, done that little bit of analysis and found out when the switch, the last switch onto 25 was, and put it on here and that puts us about here. So the plot I just showed you, here we are, we're, we're getting up for like sort of 150 ish years. So, so we're already kind of here, okay? So maybe the, the current cycle is in fact obeying this relationship and being able to refine, you know, how long the cycle is and, and get that measurement way before maximum. Well, rather than waiting from minimum to minimum can, can be quite useful in sort of saying how active the next cycle will be. We'll see how active it goes, we'll have to wait. It might go back down again, okay? But even so, we, we, we're now up to here. So that's kind of useful as well. So I'll summarize there. So basically we're in this position that individual events, impacts can be modeled in detail. We can know an awful lot about if I know the detailed behavior or particular event, how much it's gonna cost, what it's gonna do, okay? So because we're very well instrumented now and we've got great kind of codes to try and you know forecast and all this stuff. Uh, the tricky thing is, you know, when's the flare going to happen and is it going to be geo-effective? Will it hit or miss the Earth? Um, the data only goes back a few cycles, the high quality stuff. So you're in the business of looking at this historical data if you want to look at multiple solar cycles, which is tricky. But there are things we can do. 
Um, and when you do that, you find, you know, that there is this sharp switch on and switch off clock behavior, which is kind of interesting and something that we can um, maybe do something about. And then finally, this business with the Carrington event that um, if it's if it's the big, you know, it could be the really big stuff. If it's the really big stuff, then we can't really say how likely it is based on the smaller things. So but if it's kind of moderate, then we can. OK, and I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra. This was very, I would say, a thoughtful talk. Um, I think it would take a while for us, at least for me, to understand uh, and all the implications. So thank you so much. So let's, we have a time for questions now. And um, for those who joined later, um, if you have a question, please write it down in the chat and we go through the list of questions. Right now, we have some time for that. So let me start right away with um, Jason Durr. Um, who had a question about um, the uh, GSC impacts, which is certainly not a naive question, unlike what you said. And what is the question? So, I will write. Uh, Jason, can you turn on your mic, microphone? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I was just wondering if it's possible to shut down sensitive portions of the grid within some time period to avoid uh gic impacts or mitigate the damage from them or something yeah so so yeah you, you've got two options one is shutting things down and then you've got to work out the cost of the impact of that because if you're not mm -hmm. supplying power um but you might argue well if as these things are quite short you know you might be able to just shut it down for a really short period rather than have it get trashed and have it down for you know hours or whatever um but the other is just spending more money beefing up the protection of the system. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a balance between those two things. With, with Quebec, they actually just spent the money beefing up, you know, the system protection rather than switching it off. Because once they knew how much it was going to cost them, because it happened, it was cheaper to do that. Okay. So that's why figuring out how much things cost is important. So, so that's what they practically did. So if that event happened now, you would not get that power outage in Quebec because they spent I the see. Yeah. But, but maybe for a sufficiently extreme event, it might be better yeah, to shut it down. Exactly. Out. Yes, exactly. Because hopefully, you, but then you would have to argue it's going to cost you less to switch it off for that short time. Right. Yeah, rather than the impact. So you'd have to convince people, you'd have to have the numbers to convince people that the short power outage that you were going to impose on them would cost them mm. less mm. than what would happen if you didn't do it. Yeah, I see. Had All right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, Andrew Lazarevich, you have a question about the, the tech TC. If you, normally you should be allowed to speak. Yes, thank you very much. I thought this was a very interesting, interesting talk and uh, thought provoking. The question is: If um, how does the solar flare and your clock affect, uh, or could does it affect the total electron content in the ionosphere? Because the total yeah. electron content can be used for radio transmissions, for uh, transmission yeah. of other things, and also of uh, markers of storms as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I do. I'm actually working on tech now. Um, okay, so we've already shown that F10.7 F radio flux is an overall good indicator for tech. People use it to model tech. Hmm. And we've already put that on the clock, and you can see that there's quite a sharp change in the level of F10.7 at the switch off and on. So we can already say something about F10.7, which is an overall driver. In the detail thing, this is some, one of the things I'm kind of wanting to do, is what we need to do, tech, there's a lot of detailed information. We, we need a kind of tech parameter. I mean, people have, it's, it's just like the DST problem, that you need to put a number on it. And we used, I talked about DST for, for ground impacts. For tech, you'd need to put a number on the tech maps. Uh, and there are numbers that people use to say, you know, what's the peak tech value? What's mm -hmm. the variability? So you'd have to, it, it's something that I'm planning on doing is trying to look at some of these numbers and see how, and putting those on the clock to see what will happen. It hasn't been done yet, but it's tricky because you've got to figure out what's the right parameter. Because th 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 this is a, a thing I'm deeply interested in. We've got a lot of data now, and, but mm -hmm. it's only useful if you can boil it down into a few numbers that tell you what you want to know. And, and yeah. the threshold in those numbers, and that is and that is the case with tech. People just want a number. They they they, they produce these lovely maps, and people do use the maps. But you know, a number that characterizes the tech map 
it would be the first step and that's an interesting problem so it's something i'm actively interested in so thanks for that well that would, that would certainly be very interesting especially since tech maps are now being extended into three-dimensional yes. plots yes so it's really nice and just for people listening you you can they do publish online 15 minute tech max if, if you're interested you can get these things mm -hmm. and have a look so it's an available resource for people use thank you very much it's very interesting good luck <laughs> thank you so uh, patricia rife you had a question about odd versus uh, even cycles and that's a tricky one <laughs> Hi, yeah, in fact, I see someone else has asked the same question. Mm -hmm. um, have you tried separating the odd yeah, cycles from the even cycles? I have, cycles? I have, and I think, let me go. This is, I did this, I, there is, I have another paper on this. So people might know about Sargent's results that, you know, the, the, so the thing I'm going to look at now is, is it's the 27 day correlation in AA. So I talked about amplitudes in AA, okay, you know, before on the clock. But if you can also ask, because the sun's got a 27 day rotation, okay, you can look at the correlation. And this was done by Sergeant ages ago. He's a lovely chap. He did this like with, you know, nothing, okay. Now you can just do it on your laptop. You just calculate correlation. So I, so I did this. Um, and here is a hail cycle clock. So this is a 22 year clock, okay. So, you know, and what, and what I'm plotting on here, I'm plotting uh, the F10.7 again. And the red thing is, uh, it, it, it's the correlation. So what he did, I, I kind of, you, you, because you, what you can do once you've got the clock, rather than trying to do a running average thing, which is smooths everything out, you know, once you've actually got the clock, you can, you can kind of bin it across the cycle. So this is like a histogram binning the values of, of the ACF essentially. So, and what you can see is this it is a really nice house cycle effect. Okay, so this is how, how strong the 27 day correlation is in the solar wind. Okay, so, so, so at the maxima, it, it, it's not there because you're seeing all the flares. But as you come into the quiet period, you start seeing these 27 day structures. And that's what we are seeing. And you see it all in declining phase. So here's declining phase. So, it, so you know, there it is high and then you get to minimum and it drops on, on one half of the hail cycle. The other half of the hail cycle, it just kind of stays high all the time. And it changes really quickly. Again, it's really interesting. There's a lot of structure in there though, but it changes really fast. So you, you And so you sort of switch on this declining phase and then it kind of switches off. And it's definitely, it has, as well, people would expect it, but it has a hail cycle effect. Mm. So, yeah, lots more of interesting stuff in there as well. Yeah. So there's a recurrent question that is that also pops up here is about the code and whether you have um, publicly available code for reproducing these graphs. I and maybe that's I, not so easy to answer. <laughs> I, I can. Well, this is I. I ha, oh dear, this is all done in MATLAB. Um, mm -hmm. I have like a thousand lines of MATLAB that does these plots. I have yet to put it out. Um, I yeah, it would be great to do it if what I need to do is really get a proper project going. I mean, maybe to like make a kind of web page so people can put their data in and they can get the stuff out. But the mm -hmm. underlining idea is really simple, actually. I mean, the clocks are all very fancy, but really it, it's it is just a Hilbert transform of the data mm -hmm. of the sunspot mm -hmm. number. And so, you know, all the parameters are in my papers, and I've done things like uh, look at you know, track through ranges of parameters because you have to smooth the sunspot number a little bit to get rid of you know to do hilbert phase you want something that kind of goes up and down so you've got to smooth it and you've got to take a trend so i tried for lots of different numbers yeah. and i put all this stuff in my papers so if you can do a hilbert transform and you can get the sunspot numbers from silso so that it's all publicly available you can make the clock mm. pretty straightforwardly actually um my code is really horrible but but that that part is like five lines mm. all the rest of it is making all this the fancy clock <laughs> okay so yeah but but the how how to do it is in my papers and i'm, I'm happy to talk to people and, and you know if people want to know what we, what we did and all these indices are publicly available so there's a question by by john Bergpile. um john um you can speak up if you wish about uh, using cosmogenic isotopes to go further oh. back in time yeah 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 there are papers out there that use beryllium 10 you know carbon 14 that's sort of thing that are produced by the strong solar energetic particles mm -hmm. that make it you know in the ground level events yeah. yeah that does push it back quite a ways i realize statistics are low just curious if you've looked at that i it's not my area of expertise um 
I looked at the papers, obviously. Uh, I, the question is, you, you want the sunspot number. I mean, you know, to, I mean, you know, right. you know, so. people have done that, though. They have to try to, to kind of look, line up with solar activity as well and try mm. to say, does it happen maximum? But it, it's quite tricky to do. Mm. So you know, I, I, I was yeah. curious. I'm sorry. I was curious, though. You're, you're getting some information on statistics. Does yeah. it match anything like they get? Uh, I I, it's difficult to say this, okay. but this, this is the real problem, actually. And this is what I'm trying to solve with, with this chart that I showed. It's when you do statistics, it's, it's comp you want to compare like things. Mm -hmm. And so and, and it kind of drives you to compare like things that aren't that interesting. So like DST, because we've got a lot of DST, people have done lots of statistics on DST because they are like things. I can happily compare DST across four or five cycles, but I can only do DST. And what I really want is something else. You know, I want to compare it with something else. But mm -hmm. statistically, how do you compare uh, heterogeneous things? It's really tricky. It's something I'm talking to some mathematicians about to try and think about how you do, you know, how you compare heterogeneous things. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a, I, it's it's a tricky one. You know, that there's clearly there's information in all these different quantities. How do you in, combine it in, into a quantitative statement about risk? Mm -hmm. it's, it's really interesting and tricky, and, yeah, and something I'm thinking about. Yeah, so thank I don't you. know. How to do it. <laughs> Thank you, and thanks for a great talk. Okay. So, um, coming back, Antonella, you had a question about prediction capabilities. Yes, thank you, Sandra. This was a wonderfully uh, informative talk. So, I'm speaking as a non-expert, but a curious astrophysicist. So, what do you need, you know, in in the future, what do you need to improve the the prediction? So, in terms of data. Uh, missions, model, what are the things that you think, you know, a uh, request to the community, what is yeah. needed? I mean, gosh, it's tricky. It's tricky because, okay, better, okay, in terms of forecasting, I, I don't do forecasting. You could ask people who do forecasting and they will say, you know, we, we just, you know, what forecasters will say is we want more upstream data and we want better computers and better models, mm -hmm. just like weather mm -hmm. forecasters. And if you do enough of that, you'll get the answer. And that's probably partly true. Um, and that's forecasting. In terms of what I'm, I'm trying to talk about, um, it, it, I, we really want historical, we, there's historical data. We want historical data to look over many cycles. We, as I say, we're really well instrumenting the system now um, we want two things. We want historical data. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to talk to historians, you know, get things like ship's logs, you know, um, which means and maybe, you know, some sort of AI drilling down into all this stuff to get this information from the past. We need things like that. We need ways of combining. Again, it's, it's really interdisciplinary, this, and I'm trying to reach out to figure out how to do it, combining different kinds of information. Um, this might mean, you know, kind of a neural network type approach of thinking about how you gather information about impacts and, and rank it and compare yeah. it with physical things, how we do that, that is actually quite tricky. Another thing uh, actually is talking to astronomers because looking at other suns, other stars, because now they can start see they can start seeing flaring and they're starting to relate flaring mm. to rotation periods to all these things. So I'm trying to talk to these guys and say, well, can you tell me about Carrington events on stars? And but again, they've only got them for really short periods. You know, they'll observe something, but they haven't got it for very long. It's really intriguing and frustrating that they've got, you know, we're just not quite there with it. We just need to observe a few of these things for longer. Mm. And also they never seem to look at suns. They always look at these huge things because it's easier to find some massive, exciting, exploding, whatever. You know, you, you see their charts and they've got all this law, all these things there. And then the sun's like right over the other side because it's like really boring. <laughs> it's because you know, it's small. But see, so I think in the future, getting their data, we, you know, because they've all this, they're really getting data now might inform what we're doing as well but kind of you know you. just to put just i mean i shouldn't say this because everybody says oh give us another mission you know but just yeah. just you know <laughs> we, it's not just about can we have another spacecraft or whatever mm. or a bigger computer i think putting all this stuff together is it, it's quite challenging it's very interdisciplinary mm. you know, but thank you thank you very much this is great Okay, so now be prepared. We have a bunch of more questions. Okay. <laughs> so here's one by Valentina Zarkova uh, about, oh, okay. again, yeah. about uh, odd versus even cycles. Yeah. Valentina? Uh, hi, can I, can I, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yes, go ahead. Oh, good. <laughs> I thought we are mute. We were not. Um, 
I uh, can offer you, you ask us for the data, I can offer you the eigenvectors of solar background magnetic field with magnetic polarity for 370 years. So oh. you can compare. Oh, it, it doesn't. What does uh, it tell me though? I'm not an expert. What, what does pardon? That, what does that tell me in terms of like flares? It will tell you actually for, from cycle from 1900 to uh, 2020, this magnetic field coincide with the solar cycles. They become slightly different in the 18th century and 19th century, but there are some errors in the cycle for sunspots. Yeah. So what you can find much more interesting results with our data, because these are eigen vectors of magnetic field, which do not change depending on how there were observations done in the past. So we detected the them and they keep uh, solid for the period. So, and the, we can compare, for example, we compared this uh, magnetic field with occurrences of uh, volcanic eruptions. And we found that 84% correlation of volcanic eruptions maxima during the cycles, uh, during the even cycles when the solar polarity is uh, negative, when we have largest geomagnetic storms on the earth. So when we have southern magnetic polarity of uh, magnetic field on the sun, which happens on cycle 24, 26, all even cycles, yeah. then um, in, this increases um, number of volcanic eruptions on the earth and probably some other processes. We didn't look at them. We didn't have other data. So if you wish to look at your data, we can compare with your data, compare what happened with volcanic and earthquakes. I'm, I'm just wondering what, what I, I don't know what this, you'll have to explain what the data is, because is, is it telling me about extreme space weather events? Is, is, it, is it an average quantity or is it? What well, is this it? is telling you much more than sunspots, because this is the magnetic field which you measure near the Earth, like interplanetary magnetic field. Oh, it's the interplanetary magnetic field? Yeah, yeah, this is oh. the one. Is we, it we like, what, daily or something? Or oh, well, We have, we done it per current on rotation. We didn't do. Oh, it's but per current on rotation. Oh, okay. Well, I'll talk to you offline about it, shall I? But, you know. Yes. Yeah, I yeah, think, sure. I think that would be you good. You have my email. Yeah, 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 I'll get in touch. I'll get in touch. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm still at Northumbria. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> Northumbria, loads of people going there now, apparently. So oh, yeah, we have a very good team now in Northumbria, really yeah. nice. It was our James McLaughlin, he created the team. We're very proud what he made, okay. so it's wonderful. I'll chat, I'll, so, I'll chat offline then. Okay, okay that's <laughs> Bye bye. You, Tina. So, bye. there's just a comment by uh, Kathy Constable, She's, she says that she has a proxy for DST based on already observed data, which is going back to 1903. Okay. One century to, to share. So, yeah. Kathy, if you have a link or something, please don't hesitate to post yeah, it. In, in yeah, the I mean, people got my email, right? I mean, all big. Yeah. Um, okay, there's a quick technical question. I don't know if you can answer that by, by Jim Connell. It's about transformers. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I don't know. That's maybe not. I'll, I'm not Jim, can you? ask you a question this sort of relates to impacts in yeah. that my understanding is that uh the power grids are affected when currents go over the saturation limit of transformers and if they cut back on their current they don't actually have to turn systems off they can mitigate their intermediate approaches to mitigation that's possible I'm not an expert on it. It's I'm yeah. <laughs> you probably know more about it than me. Um, All right. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, it's possible. Um, maybe that answers the other person's question. So, but yeah, yeah. It, but again, you just they just need to know they have to be given some, you know. Um, That's right. Or and whatever when they when they should do that. Yeah. Yeah, and the big thing is more warning. With something upstream so that you know what the magnetic field orientation is in the cme i i exactly, would think exactly that's right exactly that is the big problem because the the, yeah. the impact is uh, depends a lot on that mm. yeah, how bad the storm is going to be all right thank you i'm sorry it was too technical no that's always my it's just no not problem. my field i mean you know <laughs> 
so Jason there had had another question about uh, edge effects um, with the Hilbert transform. Oh, yeah, Jason? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I was just wondering how sensitive the clock is to changes in the uh, original temporal averaging period, so Gleisberg cycle. If you slightly change the time averaging, does that change the clock a lot or just a little bit? There's a range. I've actually, I have actually done this. Um, th there's a range uh, over which it kind of doesn't change very much. Um, I can't remember the numbers, but it's in my paper. So we basically, we just tried it, you know, mm. we just tried the sliders. So there's a kind of decent range over which it doesn't ch change very much. Um, okay. This is yeah, the 2023? Sorry? Uh, this is the 2023 paper? Uh, or... Well, all of them. I always put it in. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I'll so, check out the papers. So it's in all of them. Or if you can't find it, just email me and I'll tell you. But yeah, there's a kind of range of which you can do it. Um, okay. it, it it's kind of, if you, if you, the thing that messes it up, okay, I can get, the, it's the numbers. But if you think about what the time series looks like, so what you're trying to do for the slow trend you, you've just to make the Hilbert work you, you you've got to go around the phase has to increase with time okay for Hilbert yeah. to make sense this is this is this is what this smoothing is all about so if you think about it, the phase has to increase with time because you know um so mm -hmm. what can break that is either yeah. if you if the if you if your slow trend doesn't kind of turn the thing into a solitary pattern so if you miss a cycle some of the cycles are quite small so if, if the slow trend doesn't pick up all the cycles you know, you miss one of the small guys, then then it'll do a little loop, you know, yeah. and, and, and the phase will go back. So so that's getting this. So the band on the values for the slow trend are just such that you turn it into, a you know, a crossing. It crosses every, you know, cycle. OK, I so that will work as long as that happens. But if you if obviously if, if you don't, you know, if you make the trend, if you just, just draw a straight line, then the yeah. small guys just won't cross. Yeah. And, if, and if you do it too much then of course it will cross more than once. So, so that's mm. what sets that range. And it, it, they're kind of a couple of decades in value. Mm. The, the fast one, the kind of smoothing, the, the actual time series you've got, you know, is like this, okay? That mm. It's fluctuating sort of daily. And so if you leave all those fluctuations in again, the phases will go back and two. So mm. you're taking those out. So you've got to smooth enough, you know, say monthly or whatever, um, to take out these fast fluctuations, which you're not interested in because you're interested in the, the, the cycle crossings. Right. Okay. But again, if you smooth that guy too much, you'll start to kind of get rid of cycles crossings. Yeah, real crossings. Yeah. yeah exactly. And and so again, those are the things. So if you explore it with the, I mean, I, you know, done this, but you know, they're not magic numbers. If you just do it for the different smoothings, you'll see that's, and look at the time series, you can mm -hmm. see that's what's happening. You know? All right. So, or you get like double crossings if if you if you don't smooth you, you know enough you've got this spiky business when, when it crosses you know it, it will cross multiple times you know this kind of thing so you, you you'll get multiple terminators and this kind of stuff shows up so yeah all right that makes sense. see when it's going wrong and that's what you should just to look at the times so you, you can see when it's this it's going wrong and mm. you can look at things like over the k the crossing times and see how much they change and all this kind of stuff and which is what i did yeah all right that makes perfect sense all right yeah thank you for a great talk okay so we have three more questions and then we'll stop um because otherwise we'll, this will continue forever so the first one is by Ilya Soskin, our uh, space climate expert yeah <laughs> yeah Hello. Hello, uh, thanks Anna, for the excellent uh, space climate related talk yeah. i really enjoyed it my question is uh when you want to go uh, further back in time, can you use information on the equatorial ex extent of low latitude auroras? Historically, that's what uh, Hisashi Hayakawa and Kogokos yes. do. And then can it be compared to the 11 year cycle, sunspot cycles reconstructed now for a millennium long? You know, our pay paper of the of the last year based on radiocarbon so we so we want something like this 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 is what i know how to do okay so this chart so what these this is showing so that this time and and phase so this is my hilbert transport cycle so this is also from the sunspot number okay and then the, these are actually from uh dolores's paper you know that she's she's talking about you know aurora equatorial aurora so you don't know you can't I don't know what the DST is, but I just I know when it happened. All I need to know is when it happened. 
And so, uh, you know, and I need the sunspot number. And so I can put these things on. So that's what I'm doing. So as long as you've got something that's telling you what the sunspot number's doing and you've got your date and these, and it could be just a month, you know, it doesn't have mm. to be a day. You, you can do this. Uh, okay. and, you know, so, yeah. and that, so that's, that's what this does for you. So yeah, that it's possible to, to stick these things on there. So, okay. Yeah. So and now yeah. solar cycles are extended for one millennium. Well, okay. But you, <laughs> then it, it depends how good those are, but yeah. If you put them on, you can always do this. You can always, I mean, you can help, you know, if you've got your, you've got it, you can help but transform them and mm. do this mm. and make this chart. You can make this chart because that's okay. all it is. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. The next one is by uh, William Wall. William? If you're ready to ask your question. Hello. Um, Hello. Yeah. Uh, I was fascinated by your movie of the electrical grid that you um, showed us. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering, has that been done on a larger scale? Can you put do it for the whole world, for example? And uh, what would you learn from that that you wouldn't learn from the UK alone? Oh, well, okay. You've got to have a model for the grid. So I'm just popping back to this guy. Um, so we basically worked with BGS and they work with the national grid and they have a model for their grid. So you, you have to be able to, oh, it's not working, is it? Uh, let me see if I make it work. No, it doesn't want to do it. Okay. Um, so so if you had, I mean, of course the world grid, yeah, if, you, if you've got a model and all for the, all the connections as well, obviously the peak, because I mean, we get a lot of our e electricity from Norway and France and places like that. So we're connected into the sort of European grid. Um, yeah, if, if you have a model, you can do that. And, and I think, I mean, thinking just regionally, like sort of about Europe, that, that would tell you things like, um, oh, it's interesting, the one this though, um, in principle, you know, if we had some space where the problem, you know, what, how would that change our decision to get electricity from Norway? Okay, for example, because, you know, you, you, you could do, you know, planning like that, um, as long as you've got the model, but these are very detailed models. I don't actually have this model, uh, because they won't give it to us, it's proprietary, but what they will do is, is run it for us and give us the outputs and then we can mm. do some stuff with okay. it. So so this is part of the issue is that power companies won't just, these models aren't just completely available, okay, generally. Um, it, interestingly though, I think the US grid, there's some work's been done there, it's not our work, I think Ryan McLaughlin's done a paper uh, and they did get some actual data on GICs so this, this is all model GICs they actually got some data for the US national grid. We, we're, we're actually working with this stuff now to see if we can do something useful with it. Um, so it, some of this data is coming out, but it's kind of, you're in this semi-proprietary area with it, uh, yeah. you know, to try and get it. it, it it's a pity because if it was all out there, we could just do things with it. Yeah. But, what, yeah. That's what I'd like to know. What can you do with it once you have all that? Well, what we're doing here, I mean, this, this is model. So you've got past timescale model GICs. You can say, well, what we're doing here is saying, well, what's correlated with what? We're, we're actually, with what we've done, we've done, I didn't have much chance. So there's a whole thing here, okay? We, we did a wave, high wavelet decomposition because you're interested in the sort of past changes, the dB by dt, mm -hmm. okay? And then and then looked at cross correlation. So where are all the fast changes? Uh, and the idea is, well, some, some nodes are super nodes and they always know what's going on in the network. So if you've got a super node and you're saying, well, where should I instrument? You know, I want to make a decision. We're talking about well, making these decisions or switching things off or whatever. That will be based on real time instrumentation. Where do I put my instrumentation? You put it on the node, which is which is correlated with the other ones, because what, what that node does, or, you know, will affect large areas of the grid. Yeah. So that's what you can do with it. Where some other node might never be connected in. I mean, some of these nodes. So if you instrumented that node, it will tell you about that guy and nothing else. Hmm. Whereas if you instrument the one that's really connected, it's going to tell you about what's going on all over the grid hmm. in, in, as the response. So that's kind of what we're looking at here, because you, you, they're limited in how much they're going to instrument it. Yeah. So. All right, thanks. Okay. And we have a last question for Dave by uh, Mark Sargent. He's not the same Sargent as the one you mentioned oh, okay. in the Seven Day <laughs> Index. Mark? Um, Yes, I hope you can hear me. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so this is again a question from someone who is completely unfamiliar with the topic, but I was wondering, so you mentioned the difficulty of hit or miss predictions. Yeah. Uh, and I was just wondering if you could give us a sense of sort of the, the relative frequency with which you 
initially expect the hit, but then it doesn't materialize versus you think you're on the safe side and then something does happen. And I oh, guess no, related, yeah. related to that is also how often this is reassessed that something will turn in a hit into a hit or or not. <laughs> okay, I don't have those numbers because that's that's forecasting. Uh, yes, people are really interested in that question, and yes, it is revisited because what people are doing. You'll you'll find if you're interested, you'll find uh, Noah has a website. Um, the UK Met Office have a, has a website. I'm sure there's a European website as well, which has space for the predictions. Mm. And so people are running, they're taking basically images of the sun and solar wind, the sort of data I was showing you, and they're using it, they're plugging it into models of the solar wind. So they're running real time predictions. Mm. Maybe I could show you one. I think I did have a couple of these in here somewhere. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe if I could show you, I, well, right, that's where I got this thing from. I showed you. Oh, I know where it is. I'll, I'll just quickly show you it and then you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, Sorry about this. Uh, this. There we go. So this little thing I'm showing you down at the bottom here um, is actually, I, I think I got this from the Met Office one. Um, this is this is a model um, where they're looking at um, the structure of the solar wind. So, so these are the CMEs coming out from the sun. So they took an image, you know, the behavior of the sun, they plug that into the model, and then you can see these, and, and this is where the satellites are and so forth. And so um, this is these things are being run all the time, and you can look at them on the web. OK, and, and so then you can from from these models, you can sort of try and assess, well, you know, what will happen to Earth. And mm. so people are doing this all the time. And obviously they're trying to improve their predictions. So so that's how it's done. It's quite a big effort. Mm. So the idea is you can then there's a lot of effort to take models like this and then plug them into models, you know, of the Earth, of the Earth's magnetosphere mm. and, and its dynamics as well. OK, so it's an on, ongoing you know effort to try and forecast space weather. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't know that the actual numbers of how good they are um, because it's not. <laughs> you go to conferences, you'll have whole sessions on on answering that question, and people using various metrics. The other question is, what metric? You've just chosen a very good metric. You yeah. know, what metrics do people use to sort of say how good their their models are, how well they're doing? And and so you know, the, the answer is quite sensitive to those metrics as well. That's a whole big area, okay, to a discussion. So yeah. Interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think this concludes today's webinar. Thank you again so much, Sandra, for this uh, thought-provoking uh, talk. I really liked it very much. And um, so th this talk will be uh, in a few days will be available on the internet. So if anyone in the audience would like to to listen again to it, please feel free. And with that, um, we'll be back in about one month with a new series of webinars. It will not be in the same topic. It will be something different, cosmology, astrophysics, planetary science, and so on. So we look forward to meeting you again, either at EC, you're always welcome, or on the web again. So, and again, Sandra, many thanks for your presentation. <laughs> Pleasure.